Ever since Street Fighter 2 and Mortal Kombat came out in the early 90s, there have been no shortages of new fighting games each year. After nearly two and a half decades, the genre is still evolving and adapting to new technologies and indie games are now possible with cheaper computers, crowdfunding, and widely available software development kits. Fighting games have seen more experimentation than ever before at a time when gaming is becoming a mainstream phenomenon. Because the enjoyment of competitive fighting games is correlated to the time invested in it, one must choose wisely in order to not spread oneself thin. He chose poorly. So what makes a fighting game worth spending hundreds, if not thousands, of hours practicing? The first thing that's noticeable is the franchise. It may seem shallow, but an established franchise ensures that people will notice the game and give it a try. It's certainly not a guarantee that the game will be any good, but at a certain level there's a kind of pride with playing an iconic character. Laf wants to be known for his Ryu setups, not his Mizoguchi tech. Dominion and Knuckledoo want to prove who the best Guile is, not who the best Matlock is. And Infiltration, well Infiltration might actually have a pocket fail-in that no one knows about, but I digress. Of course Street Fighter 2 characters were unknown when it first came out, but it didn't take long before it became the brand it is today. A franchise can give a big boost to the awareness of a game, and games like Mortal Kombat 10 have added characters like Jason and Predator, with gameplay videos racking up to millions of views. A franchise is also a way for game companies to get into the fighting genre with a head start. A prime example of this is Nintendo and Super Smash Bros. Sadly, their IP is so top tier that they demand to be paid when users show their games on YouTube, which is why you're looking at Ultra Dario right now. But ultimately, a game would be nothing without its gameplay. For some reason, when people new to fighting games play for the first time, they tend to mash buttons as fast as they can. I mean, you don't see this happen when people play Civilization, for example, but we're lucky games don't work this way. A fighting game where the sole goal is to press all the buttons as fast as possible will be a terrible game, and this is why we have what's known as gameplay mechanics, and it's arguably what determines the longevity of a fighting game. While fighting games typically don't have a ton of content compared to other genres, tournament players will spend thousands of hours practicing one game, and mastering one technique may take the same amount of time as beating an epic RPG. This might seem a bit insane, especially since training stages in these games look like insane asylums, but it's a testament to a well-made game mechanic. But what about new or casual players who haven't spent their whole lives playing fighting games? After getting past the mashing phase, a player might try to actually learn the game's special moves. This is where execution comes in and where a lot of people give up. As much as it may seem like it, special move motions weren't made to frustrate players, but to make the more powerful moves harder to execute. It makes sense if you think about it. The amount of concentration and energy it would take for Ryu to perform a Shoryuken and jump 6 feet in the air would be greater than, say, a standing jab. But what if Ryu turned into a spunky Mexican girl and operated a robot suit? She'd be able to do a Shoryuken at the press of a button. I'm of course talking about Rising Thunder. Fantastico. It isn't the first time a fighting game has been simplified to appeal to a wider audience, but it's the first time to do so while leaving most of the fundamental mechanics similar to a traditional 2D fighting game. While one-button special moves will certainly lift a large entry barrier, people will still have to invest time in learning things like combos, blocking, teching, hitboxes, hurtboxes, and frame data. It begs the question, if people weren't willing to invest time in learning a quarter circle motion, will they invest it in the other crucial aspects of the game? Will they commit themselves to the padded white room listening to a 30 second music clip over and over again? If cherry picked anecdotal evidence means anything, our office did switch over to playing this from Mario Kart 8, and I'm the only one who knows how to throw a Hadouken. So is it possible for an easy execution game with advanced mechanics to be successful? According to EVO 2015's registrants, yes. But is it possible without an overpowered franchise backing it? Well, that will depend on its accessibility. The best fighting game isn't worth much if you can't play it. Back in the early 90s, all you needed to start your fighting game career was a quarter. Since arcades have pretty much vanished, the requirements have gone up. Now you need an internet connection, a game, a controller, a low lag monitor, and either a console or PC. Even though it's 2015 and these are common things to own, it's not cheap. With developers wanting as many people playing the game as possible, many games are now free to play and available on the PC, the current most popular gaming platform. But competitive Super Smash Bros. Melee is not on the PC, requires a discontinued console and an ancient CRT television, and it still has one of the biggest communities with some of the biggest prize money awarded in the fighting genre. 
This is all without any online play, a feature now regarded as determining the fate of a fighting game's success. We know fighting games have been successful without the boost of an existing franchise and without being completely accessible, but there is yet to be a long-lasting fighting game with poor gameplay, and it seems that the way developers approach this will determine which fighting games will reign on top. Alienating casual players is certainly not the way, but neither is alienating the hardcore players. In regards to advanced Super Smash Melee techniques, series director Masashiro Sakurai felt that the competitive scene is playing Melee wrong and feels the game should be more geared towards casual players. So much so that the following game, Super Smash Brawl, removed wave dashing and L cancelling, two gameplay mechanics that made Melee such a hit among competitive players. I think this is the wrong way to think about it. I enjoy playing Melee casually with my friends because of its easy inputs, and Armada can find his enjoyment playing Mango with the advanced stuff. Taking away mechanics that Armada and Mango enjoy isn't going to make me enjoy the game any more with my friends, and it's not going to increase my chances of beating Armada anyways. You can remove almost all the execution in a fighting game and reduce it to just two buttons, and top fighting game players like Chris G will still win. See, here's the thing, right? I mean, you said Chris G is the first time he's played, but this is what, how much of this game relies on fundamentals exactly. and strategy. Exactly. And why remove an advanced mechanic entirely when people enjoy it? Why not embrace it and improve upon it by making it easier for beginners to enjoy it? After all, this is precisely what happened with the combo system in Street Fighter 2, which is now a staple of nearly every fighting game. What turns people off to a fighting game is not the skill gap. If thousands of Let's Play videos have taught us anything, it's that casual players like to watch other more skilled people play a game. Ultimately, what makes a fighting game worth playing is having other people to play. The spirit of fighting games has always been one of inclusiveness, where anyone with a quarter could participate. As good as single-player modes on fighting games have become, it won't satisfy the ones constantly seeking the next challenge. 